3C Experience presents Real Estate Entrepreneurship Leadership with your host, Jazz Takar. The REC Experience Podcast is now on air. Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for joining us here in the REC Experience. I'm your host, Jazz Takar, with your girl, Laura Eltol Stewart. How you doing, Laura? I'm doing great, Jazzy. How are you? I'm, I'm very excited. Very, very excited. Sorry for the uh, listeners who are in your car or taking your dog for a walk. You can't see the handsome looking face. I'm not talking about myself. I know I talk a lot about myself, but I'm speaking about the gentleman below here, Marcus Buckingham. He's joining us today, author of Standout. And we're going to be speaking about the book and all things that he's been up to during this pandemic and, you know, his past life and what he's looking forward to that coming up in the new in, in the near future. Marcus, how are you doing today? I'm amazing. It's a Monday morning. Uh, all is well. Well, not all is well, but it's a Monday and it's a beautiful day. So lots of, lots of good things. We, we really appreciate you joining us. And we're going to talk a little bit about your book. Uh, but before we get into that, Marcus, I mean, you know, I'm a big comic book fan and my listeners and viewers know that. And so why don't you give us a little background on yourself, like that, com- you know, how, how you came about to get your super your superpowers? Wow, that's a question for a Monday morning. Uh, I'm originally from London. Uh, I came to America in 1987, and I joined the Gallup organization, which is located in Lincoln, Nebraska, of all places. So I spent my first six years in the U.S. in Lincoln, Nebraska. But I, uh, I, I came right after university to study uh, a thing called psychometrics, which is how do you measure things about people that are terribly important but that you can't count. How do you measure talent? How do you measure strengths? How do you measure engagement? How do you measure resilience? Things that we know are part of the human condition, but, but you, can't, you can't count them. Can you measure them? And of course, that leads you to the world of psychology. It leads you into the world of um, uh, personality and personality assessments. And so I got started doing that. Actually, originally, pre-employment selection tools. So how do you select people who have talents that might fit the particular job they're, they're um, searching for? And then that led into uh, building a tool called StrengthsFinder, uh, which I did with Don Clifton back in 2000. Um, StrengthsFinder was really the first effort to try to have a language to describe you positively. Almost all other kinds of personality assessment are based upon what's wrong with you. Um, so Myers-Briggs is based on pathology. Minnesota multivariate personality inventory is based upon what's wrong with you. Um, even things like Enneagram are based on things that are based initially on pathology. So StrengthsFinder was this effort to go, wait a minute, not that we shouldn't study those things, but let's study what's right with you. And then um, we put that out in 2000, and then in about a decade later, I decided that we ought to build, uh, StrengthsFinder was really a tool for the individual just to figure out uh, a language to describe the best of you. And so with Standout, 10 years later, I wanted to build a tool that would help teams and team leaders figure out the uniqueness of each other so that you could build a, a superstar team using what you knew about the strengths of each individual. So that's where Standout came from. So my whole career really has been focused on how do you measure reliably and validly the uniqueness of an individual? I love that. And, and uh, Laura, as our director of sales and marketing, you know, she wears a lot of hats. We call her our crazy eight um, as a co-host here as well, and as our branding expert, she, after reading your book, Stand Out, said, okay, we need to take this assessment. And uh, I have to say, I had a really fun time uh, going through your assessment. So for anybody who's watching and listening right now, we'll make sure that in the episode descrip- uh, descriptions, you'll know where to go. But if you're not following Marcus on Instagram already and all the stories that he does and all the videos that he does, you're truly missing out. So make sure to go check out Marcus and uh, on his Instagram profile, but after taking the assessment, um, Laura, why don't you talk about a little bit about what what made you want us to all do this? So it, it actually started probably two months ago. A girlfriend of mine on, on Instagram said, "You you have to take this." She kind of knew that our team was growing, and as I, as I talk about, you know, what we're up to at work, and she said, "You have to take this, and you have to get your team to take this." And she sent me over Marcus's link, and I took the test, and from then on, I mean. Perhaps, Marcus, it's no surprise, I am a pioneer 
And I delved so deep into this as soon as I got it. And then I made everyone do it, even if they didn't care or they didn't want to do it. I was like, you're doing this assessment. I need to know everything about all of you. I was just so fascinated by it. Picked up your book, just finished it actually this, this past weekend um, to really try to learn more, more about myself. I guess that's really where, where things start. Um, and then obviously to try to figure out as we grow as a team, how we can better uh, speak to each other. And, and those things that maybe I once found annoying about jazz, I'm now like, okay, that's because he's the teacher. He's doing that because he's a teacher. So mm. just to let you know, I'm a pioneer provider and jazz, you're a teacher provider, right? Yes. Yeah, teacher provider. So what, 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 like, how did you come up with the actual roles? How did that come about, Marcus? Most of my career has been spent studying. You, you do what's called a, if you're trying to understand why people are good at what they do, you do what's called a concurrent validity study. So if you wanted to start, understand what's really good about a real estate agent, um, what you would do is you take 100 really good ones and 100 average ones, and you'd ask 100 really good ones a whole bunch of questions and see which way they jump. You had questions like, um, how do you know if um, uh, someone's ready to buy or not? Uh, how do you feel when someone doubts what you have to say? Um, are you a good loser? Tell me about a, a time when you overcame resistance to your ideas. Um, just a whole series of questions like that. And you would see how the highest performers answered in a way that was similar to one another and different from everybody else. And, and the goal there is to find out what, if anything, do these hundred really, really good real estate agents have in common? What kind of, not skills, because skills you can change after you hire a person and not knowledge, because knowledge you can change after you hire a person. But, but what are the, the things about each of those superstar, in this case, real estate agents, what do they have about themselves that you can ask about that is independent of race and gender and age and experience and so forth, but is in terms of their natural recurring patterns of behavior or thought or feeling. Um, so you do that and you discover that there are some patterns, uh, patterns like empathy, patterns like competitiveness, patterns like ego, patterns like um, natural curiosity. And, and then you do that study again and again and again and again across all these different professions, teachers and lawyers and doctors and nurses and financial consultants, like you name it. When you do that again and again, you find that there are certain um, frequently recurring patterns of strengths. And so when we built Standout, the goal for Standout was to go, and this may be more in the weeds than you wanted to know, but if you want to try to build a personality assessment, you have to split or you chunk. You either split or you chunk. Split means you're going to make very, very fine distinctions between different traits. Chunk is like, well, we're going to put everything together and say they're really just four personality types. So when we built Standout, we were like, you know what, let's look at all of the different strengths we've ever found and let's make the, um, the alphabet, if you like, of Standout complicated enough so that there's 72 different top two combinations. There's millions of top nine combinations, but there's, there's 72 different top two combinations. So let's make it complicated enough so that each individual has enough complexity to describe the uniqueness of themselves. And yet let's make it simple enough so that you're running a team of seven people, you're not overwhelmed. If you go around the room and go, give me a top two, 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 you as the team leader can go, oh, pioneer provider. Okay, I get, I get that teacher provider. Okay, I can get that. So what I was really trying to do is, is create enough simplicity for a team leader to be able to understand the language. There's nine. You actually, if you, if you take standout, you're measured on nine strengths. And then we, I mean, we'll show you the rank order of all nine, as you probably saw, but we'll give you your top two. And those top two are a way for you and your team leader to be able to have a fast conversation about how do you learn, how do you think, how do you sell, what drives you, how do you build relationships, how do you structure your time? All those things that if you're a good team leader and you pay attention, you might figure out after many months, maybe years. Standout was our attempt to go, let's speed that up. Because the least interesting thing about any one of us in a sense is, is what's on the surface. Our, our gender, our race, our age, our religion, our nationality, those, those are all kind of meaningful, but they're also, in a sense, less interesting than what lies beneath that. And if you want to get the best out of a person, you've, you've got to get beneath that, right? Yeah. So what I found so interesting about all this was, and Jazz, you can pro probably attest to this. Jazz always noted things about me at the workspace. And he would say, I, knew, I need to always be giving Laura new projects. So I'm a great starter. Like I wanted, I dive in like new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. But then after a year, I'm kind of like, 
not as excited about it anymore. And you almost wondered if that made something wrong with you, right? Like, well, why can't I stick to something? Um, and what's always so neat about your videos is that you talk to, you talk to people, I think your, your phrase is, I, I see you, I love you. And it's kind mm. of like, I see how you are and that's okay. And everything's very accepted, right? Like, as you say, these are all positive attributes. Um, and what was also interesting yeah. is that, like you said, there's no, you would think a lot of people would read, say provider and they would say, oh, well, that's, that's a female trait sort of, you know, what we sort of consider female traits. And then as you dive deep, like we have a number of providers on our team, mostly males. Um, mm. So I always, I thought that was interesting. And, um, you know, I think it's definitely going to help us in terms of, of how we're going to communicate going forward, or at least I hope, I hope it will and decrease the time, like you said. Well, yeah, you, you, you can't, you can't love what you can't see. And well, I, I felt like this time, I mean, I know we've been quarantined, but it's an amazing time to stop and look at the people that we are quarantined with, the people we we uh, share a family with, perhaps, share a friend group, perhaps, with, share a work team, perhaps, with. What an amazing time to stop the wind whipping past our ears and just look at one another and see one another. Um, and so often we project on one another. We don't see one another. We project ourselves on someone else. You know, it's the old, even the old adage that you treat people as you would like to be treated. When you peel the onion on that one, it presupposes that everyone likes to be treated the way that you like to be treated. And of course, that's not, that's not true, is it? Everyone likes to be treated in a way that they like to be treated. And of course, that means that you better ask questions and shut up in terms of, well, who are you, Laura? What, what, what trips your trigger? What wakes you up? Not to say, by the way, I mean, yes, Every one of these nine strengths roles is gender neutral. We know that from data. Like we've asked millions of people these, and these do not sort by gender. If you want to find out your gender, you don't give them a personality assessment. There's other ways to kind of get to gender. It doesn't sort to race. It doesn't sort to age. Like these aren't age dependent or race dependent. Um, these are, I always think of these as doorways. Like um, I'm stimulator creator. Well, my sister is stimulator creator, but she's a ballet dancer. So. So you can be very many different things uh, based upon whatever your top two are. Her manifestation of stimulator creator is really different than mine. But if you wanted to know how she and I were the same, or if you wanted to know how to get the best out of each one of us, uh, it would really help you to know that stimulator creator are two doors that you could walk through with each of us, even though I do not dance the way my sister does. Um, there is something about uh, both of us that you would know, usefully know, if you knew that we were stimulated creator. So, so that was the point for you and your team is, you know, Laura, you look like a certain way, right? But would I have guessed pioneer provider? Heck no. Or rather it might've taken me a year to figure out what are the recurring patterns of thought, feeling and behavior that characterize you and then how do we channel them productively? It might've taken that long or maybe longer. Um, so stand out was an attempt to go, let's just, let's quickly and appreciatively get to some quintessence of Laura, not that we then pat you on the head and go, jolly well done for being you, but that we, but we go, how do, you, how do you contribute those? And that was the point of it. How do you channel those? Don't go rah, rah, I'm pioneer provider, well done me. It's more like, well, how do I use that? Um, and of course, if I'm your partner, or I'm your colleague, or I'm your teammate, I can be a part of helping you use that. I can stop caricaturing you by what's wrong with you, and I can start challenging you to contribute to the team or to your clients what's right with you okay well that's an interestingly different conversation each of the roles as i as i watched your videos that you put like the long form videos you put on instagram of each person like yeah. as soon as i would learn about creator i was like i want to be a creator i wish i was a creator this is the coolest person and then all of a sudden i would hear um, equalizer. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I want to be an equalizer. So really, if you, if you delve deep into them, you'll learn that there's something really amazing about each trait, right? First of all, for those of your folks who are, li who are listening, that this assessment's free. We decide to give it away. I mean, Harvard Business Review and the ADP Research Institute have got all the power behind it and the scale behind it. Um, and there's a lot invested in it. This isn't like a little gimmicky internet test. There's a ton of research and credibility underpinning it. And I, you know, 
I designed it and created it, but it's owned and operated by those two entities. And so at the time of the quarantine, I went, look, let's just go give it away because there is no better time to help us stop and see one another. So for those of you that want to take it, it's free. Uh, Jazz or Laura, will, they'll tell you how to get, but, but it's for 15 sure. minutes. I mean, it's 15 minutes. If you want to invest time in yourself, I don't know, maybe there's a better way to spend 15 minutes than this, but this is a pretty bloody good one. Um, so <laughs> and we attest to that. And Marcus, sorry to cut you off for everybody who's watching or listening, which a lot of people that are watching and listening run big teams and big businesses. It is by far the best 15 minutes from a business owner that was spent during this quarantine. And, and I know people are reopening and so on and so forth. Take the 15 minutes to do this assessment. Um, it's probably even quicker than that. And I did it I did it all from my phone. I don't own a laptop mm. or a desktop or a computer. So it's very easy to take. So for everyone who's listening and watching, take the 15 minutes now to go do the assessment. But continue, Marcus, sorry for cutting you off. Well, what I was going to say is it measures you on nine strength roles. It's called a situational judgment test. So when you take it, you're under a timer. And it's not one way. It's obvious what choice leads to what strength. I found that so very interesting, of, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, in life, um, stimuli hit you every day. Thousands of stimuli hit you every day. This is a stimuli right now. I'm a stimulus. My voice is a stimulus to you, and you are a stimulus to me. And these choices are happening all the time. And as they're happening, um, I'm not intellectualizing my choices. I, I Stuff hits me, I react, I move, I react, I move. I re so if you're gonna, gonna try to anticipate what are my most recurring and predictable patterns of thought or feeling or behavior, my most predictable strengths, you've gotta try and mirror what happens in the real world in an assessment. So in this case, we're gonna throw a situation at you like um, a friend at work passes your idea off as her own, what would you do? Boom. That's not a weird situation, everyone's had that. A friend at work passes your idea off as her own, what would you do? We don't then give you an hour to intellectualize it, nor do we give you a bunch of choices where it's pretty bloody obvious which choice leads to which strength. You've got you know, 19, 18, 17, 16 seconds of the time ticks yeah. down. And there are, there are four choices that all seem pretty good. You know, um, Clarify with other people that it was originally my idea. Uh, confront her and tell her that what she did was wrong. Uh, let it go, because I can always come up with another one. And you probably, when you took it, I bet, you probably looked at every one of those choices and went, uh, I would do all of them. Yes, or, uh, I found that a lot. In, in a lot of the questions, I was like, yeah, yeah I would do them yeah. all. Like, yeah, I, and I've done them all in the last 24 hours. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's um, And of course, you would do all of them. But the way that you you construct an assessment like this is you you put in trigger words in every single one of the four choices. And we give each each scenario has four choices and then you're under a timer. There's a trigger word or two in there. A trigger word, like if you have, I'll give you an example. If you have um, uh, empathy, let's say I was trying to measure empathy. It actually isn't one of the nine, but let's just say I was trying to measure empathy. Um, you put the word cry in one of the four choices and under pressure, your brain will, if you're an empathetic person, will pick the response with the word cry in it. So even though you go, well, I'll do the other three as well. The word cry somehow is like a red rag to a bull and your, your, your eye or your heart or your spirit is drawn to that word. Um, there are, I won't go through all of them, obviously, but there are many trigger words. We as humans tend to learn vocabulary that helps us to describe our own experience. So when you design an assessment like this, you're constantly tweaking and fine tuning the exact wording of every single scenario so that under time pressure, Jazz, you, yes, you'd look at the four and go, ah, I do all of them. But then under pressure, you go, you go to a word and you go to a Interesting. Interesting. And you, then you constantly refine that to ensure that you're, you're, measure, you're measuring what you want to measure. But you'll find that, for those of you that are going to take this in the next few days, it will be like, well, I would do all of those. Uh, yes, and under pressure, you'll pick one, you'll pick one, you'll pick one. And what you should know is that each one of the nine strengths are measured 12 times in 14 minutes. We measure each of the nine 12 times, which means that if you come out like, like Laura did with Pioneer Provider, it's not random. That's because unbeknownst to her, when we gave her 12 chances to hit Pioneer, 12 hot chances to hit Provider, and 12 chances to hit each of the other seven, she somehow kept jumping in a Pioneer Providery way. That's not well, everything you know about her, but it's kind of cool. 
It's when when I was reading the assessment afterwards, um, you you kind of read it like Pioneer. I'm like, I'm not always like that. Like it, it's you you also realize it's not necessarily how you see yourself. Like you're, it might not be reflected in it. Cause part, as I'm reading it, I'm like, I never do that. Like I'm not the the riskiest human being. And you kind of get that sense from a pioneer. But then in reality, when I started watching my behavior over the course of the next couple of weeks, I was like, oh, I guess in a lot of respects, I, I really am. So Marcus, once you've done the assessment, does that mean like our teacher providers more adapt for certain jobs? Like, should people start thinking about changing their careers based on these things? What do, what do you find on that? Well, no. The The biggest discovery from this, if you take a hundred principles, school principles, let's say, a hundred really good ones, and then a hundred average ones, and you give them standout, what you find when you look at the study group of a hundred really good ones is they have each one of the nine strengths roles represented across that hundred. If you take a hundred really, really good real estate agents and you gave them standout, you wouldn't find that everyone was influencer provider, let's say. I care about you, but I want to close. I care about you, but I want to close. Like you wouldn't, you, in theory, you'd go, well, that's a great combination, right. influencer provider. But <clears throat> what you find is variation. What you find actually is that the most successful people in any profession have figured out what their particular comparative advantage is in terms of their superpower, just use your you figure out what your superpower is and then you leverage it intelligently. You can never have too much of a strength. People always say that, right? You, well, you've got too much of that. Turn that down. No, you don't turn that down any more than Iron Man would turn down his powers. You go use them sensibly, use them intelligently. So you could have provide a teacher and use them stupidly. You could use them ineffectually. But the point of doing this, Laura, is to figure out what, number one, what job are you in right now? Given the job you're in right now and the outcomes you're supposed to create in that job, what is your path of least resistance to those outcomes? Because let's say that you're in the real estate business, you're trying to build a clientele, you're trying to build a community of people who know you and trust you and buy from you or sell to you. Like That's what you're trying to do, obviously. So, so the question for you would be, given your top strengths, how do you build that kind of trust, that kind of authenticity. How do you do it? Because Laura's way is different than Marcus's way is different than Jazz's way. Like we better figure out our way of doing that. Mm. So that's the point of standout is what, you know, not to over quote the superpower thing, Jazz, but what is your superpower of building trust, credibility, authenticity in other people? And yeah, sometimes we are exactly to other people the way that we see ourselves. But, but if you do take this, I would just encourage you to keep your mind open to the possibility that how you see yourself is not necessarily how you come across to other people. Stand out yeah. is about how you come across to other people. And when you say risk, like you're saying, well, I'm not that risky a person. And pioneer says people, you know, pioneers like risk. Well, I'll tell you what, define risk. Because a pioneer's definition of risk is different than my definition <laughs> Right. So I bet there's a lot of people who look at you, Laura, and go, God, no, no, she's always stepping into new places. She's always stepping into new spaces. Space doesn't freak her out. She actually Mm -hmm. likes green spaces. You have you have defined our Laura to the (laughs) T with the last sentence you just said, my man, because every like she is actually really not a real estate agent. She's licensed as an agent, but her role with our company is um, uh, like director of sales and marketing. That's kind of the title, but all she does all day long is step into new roles at Mm -hmm. all times. Yeah, as Jazz was saying when we were speaking earlier, I wear a lot of hats, right? And that's funny because now I see that I actually like that. As soon as something becomes quite systematized on our team, then I always say, Jazz, what's next? What are we doing next? What's the new thing? I got to step out of that, that routine to keep things interesting to me. She so likes the to- very first, the, 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 I was going to say, the first thing you should do after you take something like this, the, the, the first person you should have a conversation with about it is yourself. That's why the first, for those of you that like, to, if you want to dive into these, um, as Jazz was saying, on Instagram, and I think I put these on my YouTube channel too, there's like 20 or 25 minute chats about who are you just talking pioneer. To, by the way? Sorry, Marcus, Laura and I, we, we were trying to, who are you speaking to on the other side of the camera? Oh, I'm speaking to um, my partner, my, Michelle, who okay. is, uh, she's, um, she's the one who always asks all the questions and is 
is preternaturally good. And she's a connector stimulator. So there's 47 questions that she has. When you say creators are like this, her little creator connector brain goes, well, what about that? Well, where does that hit that? Well, how does that? So we thought for those people that are creators and they really want to dive into what creator means, here's 25 minutes or whatever, 15 minutes on creator. If you're a pioneer and you want to have 20 minutes on pioneerness, then, then we're going to give it to you. Now, somebody else might not want to have that because they're like, I'm an equalizer teacher and I only care about those two. In which case, you can go on to either Instagram or YouTube and you can get 20 minutes on those two. Um, but that's what, uh, that's what we did those. Now, if you want 60 seconds, we did a little 60 second on each one as well. Um, but the thing, but the, the, the whole thing about it is going back to what Laura was saying. I mean, or even not to overplay the comic book thing, Jess, but like if you look at Spider-Man, he's like a really, really bad Thor. Well, he's a really, well what I mean is, you could look at Spider-Man and go, well, you're not strong enough. You're not commanding enough. You, you need to work on that, dude. I mean, if you want to become the most well-rounded superhero, this whole web, uh, incredible acrobatic thing you got going, I mean, that's great. Don't get me wrong. But where's the hammer? Where's the might? Where's the... Like, you could caricature Spider-Man as just a really bad Thor. Yes. Or you could go... You're flipping amazing Spider-Man. Let's talk through that. What is that? What is that? What is it that you do? What is it that you bring? Um, I mean, and this is whatever his uncle or whatever said, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So what's your responsibility? If you've got these gifts, what's your responsibility? Well, the first responsibility, Spider-Man, is to figure out what Spider-Man is to Spider-Man. Well, what, do you, what have you got, Spider-Man? Then you start thinking about what kind of contribution you can make to your society or to your, to your family, to your community. So in the case of this, um, Laura, pioneer provider. I don't know how old you are, Laura, but you get to 35. a point where you're like, you're 35. <laughs> okay. So, so isn't it weird, by the way, that during a time of quarantine like this, and all of these parents are trying to help their kids learn trigonometry or something, and you get to an 11 year old kid and it's like the detail around around the classes that relate to trigonometry or algebra, you go, wow, that is some really detailed math class right there. And the kid's 11. I mean, look at that textbook. It's so detailed about the difference between this shape and that or this angle and that one. And then you think, um, w when Laura was 11, did anyone anywhere at school help her have a deep dive into anything related to Pioneer Provider? Did she even begin to have a conversation about what her strengths were as an individual, all the stuff that right now at 35 that she wakes up every day and worries about, namely, who am I? What can I contribute? How do I get fulfillment? How do I join a team? How do I add value to a team? How do I bring on board a new team member? How do I establish trust? All the things that she thinks about now all the time, none of them, none of them were anything that anyone taught her about at all at school. She's 35 and no one's ever dug deep into the uniqueness of Laura. Okay, that's a tragedy because now her contribution, as well as her well-being, as well as her joy, all of it comes from being the most Laura she can possibly be. So that was the point of doing Stand Out Now is to go, look, we missed her at school. All of this, she got a ton on tri tri trigonometry. She got a ton on learning, I don't know, Spanish, but, but she didn't have anything on her. No one talked to her her about her at all. And in, and, in, and in college, at university, nothing. And then she joined the workforce. What, what, what did she get then? She got goals and she got demands and she got customers, but she didn't really get a deep dive into her. Jazz, neither did you. It's like, it is a huge miss, isn't it? And yet for those of us, I mean, I ran a business, I had a hundred people that worked for me. We built a software company, which, you know, it's a, it's a nightmare, particularly if you're not a software engineer, like I'm not. It's like, how do you do that? Everything, the more your business grows, the more you realize that almost everything to do with your business is to do with your human intelligence. How intelligent are you in terms of capitalizing on your unique humanity and the unique humanity of the people that come join your company? Or I, the clients I, I, you're trying to serve. It's like almost 90, 95% of your job is thinking about the uniqueness of humans. And we don't, Gosh, we just don't 
teach anyone how to do that. Well, I, I, what, what I really, really enjoyed about everything you just said was the fact of pushing people and, and, and giving them the awareness to go all in on the strengths because we're, we, 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 we hear so much about trying to fix ourselves like we're cars and we're broken. And I, just, like, I, I know that we're not. We, we need to focus in and own in on our strengths and then go all in on that because I think that's how you hit grand slams in your life. And if you try to fix some of your weaknesses, you might slightly, ever so slightly move the needle and maybe a little single and get you on first base. But I mean, you talk to this point here, Marcus, where if you do go all in on your strengths, chances of hitting a home run in a grand slam are a lot higher. Well, yes, this doesn't mean that, as you said, if you've got a weakness, which means, I don't know, that you uh, don't show up for work, uh, or have a little bit of a belly, for example. Yeah. Marcus, like, I'm okay now. I let go of the fact that I'm not going to lose this little love handle. Uh, here. I'm he loves to show his belly off on these things. I don't know why. <laughs> because, because I've come to realize that, you know what, this last little 15 pounds, I'm just going to live with it. I'm going to love my love handle. That's so funny. Yes, it's <laughs> it's uh, it doesn't mean that you don't go, you know, I, you're not saying you're perfect. You have flaws. I have flaws. Laura has flaws. We all have flaws. The question is, where will you? It's a, this whole kind of fixed mindset versus growth mindset thing that um, came out of Carol Dweck's work out of Stanford. Um, the idea that that you should have a growth mindset in life, which basically on some level sounds good because it's like, well, you can all grow and we can all get better, which of course is true. We can all grow. The question though, isn't really, can you grow or not? I mean, that's kind of a false dichotomy, isn't it? No one really goes around in the, in the world going, well, no one can learn anything. I mean, human beings, we learn. That's just sort of what we do. The question isn't whether you can grow or not. The question is, where will you grow the most? Now, that's a more interesting question. Where will you grow the most? And what we know from both psychological science, but also neuroscience, we know that the brain grows more synaptic connections in the areas of the brain where you have the most pre-existing synaptic connections. We know that Laura's brain uh, network and your network, your brain, your neural network is unique. No one has a neural network like yours and ever will. Same with Laura, same with me. Everyone's got this incredibly unique uh, network of, of um, neural connections. We, we also know though that you will, over the course of your life, you will grow more synaptic connections in the areas of the brain where you have the most pre-existing ones. So that's why brain scientists say that learning is like new buds on an existing branch. It's not a new branch. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean you can't, if you're not empathetic, can you learn to be slightly more empathetic mm -hmm. than you were before? Yes, you can. But if you want exponential growth, not incremental, exponential growth, and you'll figure out where you already have a thicket of synaptic connections. In a sense, you'll figure out where your strengths are, and then you'll learn to cultivate those with extreme intelligence. And to your point, that's where you hit the home run. You hit the home run where you figure out where your comparative advantages, plural, because you probably got more than one, where your comparative advantages lie, and then how do you leverage them intelligently? Um, for those entrepreneurs that are listening, Peter Drucker said the same thing about businesses. Peter Drucker said the best businesses get their strengths together and make their weaknesses irrelevant. Well, in a sense, that's the same thing for individuals. You get your strengths together, you make your weaknesses irrelevant. Doesn't mean the love handles aren't love handles, but you go, am I going to spend all of my time or am I going to, you know, you're, you're really just choosing about return on investment. Now, Marcus, now that sort of let's move through, everyone has done the strengths assessment. They now have done a deep dive as to who they are. If, you're a if I, we have any team leaders or entrepreneurs with, with teams, um, would you suggest that it's better to have people on your team of all different roles or all the same roles because at least they're communicating to the same or does it not really matter? You just need to kind of know how to communicate with each other. Well, the, the research on this because we've got nice measures of engagement, nice measures of performance, nice measures of voluntary turnover. So you can start asking questions like, well, are the most engaged teams with the lowest voluntary turnover more diverse, less diverse, 
what's because we can measure diversity, we can measure uh, frequency of each strength showing up, and and we can start to see well, are the teams with the most strengths showing up the most engaged, with the highest retention, the highest performance, or the other way around? So we can we can actually answer that question with data, and what we find is, sorry to say. There's really no difference in engagement and performance mediated through um, frequency of strengths showing up. It is not true to say that the most diverse teams are most engaging. I know it would be better to say that, but the data doesn't actually bear that out across hundreds of thousands of teams. What we can say across hundreds of thousands of teams is that when managers, team leaders talk frequently and by frequently, I mean every week, to each team member about their strengths and their work, their strengths and their work, 10, 15 minute conversations, but every week, what are you working on this week? How can I help? What are you working on this week? How can I help? So if you have a team leader, Laura, it would be like your pioneer provider. Okay, this week, where's that focused on? This week, where's that focused on? This week, we're 52 weeks out of the year, I'm in a super light touch way going, what are your strengths and how can you apply them this week? What are your strengths? How can I apply them? When that happens, your performance goes way up. Your likelihood of leaving or quitting the team goes way down. Your level of engagement goes way up. So does your level of resilience. So what we know for sure isn't that the, the best teams have the biggest mix. That isn't true. What we do know is the best teams have the greatest awareness. There's awareness. Well, there's frequent awareness. I know what your strengths are. You know what mine are. And then we put the work in the middle of it. And there's enough complexity right there. Your strengths, my strengths work. Your strengths, my strengths work times 52. Okay, that's a really good way to think about how do you get the best out of your team. It's not that everybody should be pioneer provider. It's not that everybody shouldn't be pioneer provider. It's just that if I'm leading you and you're on my team and I don't know that you're pioneer provider, then I am handicapped. I'm prevented from seeing something about you and the way in which you engage in your work that is super interesting and powerful about you. And if I, I'm not aware of that, and if you are not aware that I am not aware, like it, it spirals down, if you think, well, he doesn't know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know, then boy, everything starts falling apart. But of course, the other way around works well too. If you are aware of what your strengths are, and you are aware that I am aware, and then you're aware that I'm aware that you're aware, it, it kind of, awareness spirals up beautifully. I forgive you more. I give you the benefit of the doubt more. I judge you less. I cherish you more. I challenge you more. Like it all kind of starts working better, not in a soft and gooey way. Oh, Laura, don't worry. You don't have to try to work hard because you're a pioneer provider. No, it's not like that. It's more like, <laughs> I would love hey. that. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't, actually. You wouldn't, I, know, I bet. I <laughs> you probably want a team leader to step into you and go, hey, I need you to, if you've got the pioneer provider, these are value neutral, Laura. These strengths of yours, they're value neutral. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just patterns of behavior. So your challenge is how do you contribute them to the team? Our job as your colleagues on the team isn't to try to make you jazz. I can't make you jazz. I can only encourage you to be a bloody good version of you. So let's have a conversation about that. So, so long answer like to a lot short of work like question, a, but it's awareness. Up on the front. Like a lot of people would probably be fairly intimidated by the sounds of this as a leader. Like, oh man, I got to be checking in with all of my staff multiple times and, and catering to them. But really in the end, it sounds like it's probably going to save you a lot of time. Because like you said, it, it if you're communicating well and people feel <laughs> understood and not judged, they probably take less time off work. There's less turnover. Um, and the actual efficiency and effectiveness of their work is probably better. So it, it's something that you should probably invest in upfront, although it is going to take a little bit of time to a, learn enough about everybody, learn what each, each role really means and how to best communicate with those people. Well, it's like, yeah, it's like learning to play chess versus checkers. If you're running any sort of team, whether it's a real estate team or whether it's in my case, a software team or whether it's a team of financial consultants or a construction team, uh, it's made up of unique individuals. If you wish that weren't so, then don't run a team. Go do something else. Human beings are unique. Even if you pick them to do the same job, you've got 10 nurses in an emergency room. Yeah, but you don't. You've got 10 individuals who happen to be nurses. Now, the overall outcome is care for the patients, but they're all going to do it slightly differently. 
And if you don't like that, don't lead that team. Because that would be like trying to play chess and wishing all the pieces were checker pieces. Well, they aren't. There's a knight and a rook and a queen and a bishop, and that's, they all move differently. And your job as a chess player is to figure out how they move and then put them together in a way that is mutually supportive so that you can win the game. But you don't spend all of your time playing chess going, well, I wish you were all checker pieces because yeah. then you're just an idiot. Um, whether you like it or not, as a team leader, you've got a six, seven, ten, whatever number of people on your team. They've, they're all unique. And the power of human nature is that each human's nature is unique. That's its power. That's not its problem. That's not a bug <laughs> that you got to fix. That's its power of a human being is the uniqueness of the human being. It's sorry to riff on this if we have time. No, but continue. I, we love it. I, the, uh, and maybe if you saw my Instagram thing on this, I don't know if you did, but I, I love it that back in December 2019, so almost six months ago now, there was this Australian team of anthropologists looking for um, basically prehistoric art in um, an island off Indonesia or of Indonesia. Um, and he found this, uh, this handprint, this red handprint, and he took a little scraping of it and he found out it was about 40,000 years old which is wow. the oldest art we've ever found, the oldest. In France, there's some cave drawings of 27,000 years. This is the, this big red handprint, 43,000 years old. So he runs back from his lab in Australia, and he goes and says, let's go see if we can find any more art from way back, way back, way back, way back when. And he thinks maybe he'll find an arm or he'll find a, another body part or something. And they climb up this one cave, like 12 feet how they climb up the, the ground must have sunk over the millennia so it used to be a cave on the on the ground floor as it were but now it's up here so they climb up and in there they find this 16 foot beautiful piece of art on the wall um 45 000 years old so it's the oldest piece of art ever discovered and what it is is a is a complicated painting of these human figures that are clearly trying to corral these wild beasts to, to either to corral them or to kill them for food. And each one of these little human figures has a different animal face or animal feature. One has like the snake or the snout of a crocodile. One has the, the nose of a, an elephant. One has the face of a lion. And what you've got is there is a picture of a team. The very first thing a human being sought to draw was a, was a team. And when they drew the team, they didn't draw a bunch of people exactly the same. They drew, somebody had the strength of the elephant, somebody had the speed of the lion, somebody had the wile of the crocodile. And so from the very first human experience is the realization that a really good team has lots of different individuals on it. And the whole bloody point of a team is that you take all those unique people, you put them in a team and together, they can do something that each individual person couldn't do by themselves. To me, that blows my mind. That the very yes. first thing we sought to put on the wall 50,000 years ago was these three or four or five unique people on a team. So for any team leader watching, to your point, Laura, if you're like, ah, oh, this is going to be annoying, I'm going to have to get to know the uniqueness of my people. That's <laughs> being a team leader. If you don't get a kick out of that, don't lead a team go do something else, and that's fine. And if you don't I, get a kick I, out of uniqueness, you got a problem. I, I, I think the people that you're speaking to right now directly, myself and Laura, um, we also I also have a business partner as well. We're, we're the exact opposite of that. We definitely, definitely love what we do and want to take this to the next level. My next question kind of comes from a selfish perspective and, and, and asking you, Marcus, that I, I got teacher as my first rule. And how would you suggest that I go about leading my, specifically my core 10 staff that, that I see and I communicate with uh, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and sometimes even on an hourly basis. Is there any tips that you could give me that, that, that would say, Jazz, this, this could help you if you look at it maybe from this perspective or take this strategy and or can? Well, the thing about a teacher, um, so there are nine strengths roles, right? Teacher happens to be the last one. Of course, if you get teacher, it doesn't mean you are a teacher as a job, right. obviously. Um, we called it teacher because um, the thing, one of the things that you're naturally really good at is you meet people where they are. So, and you can't really imagine doing it any other way. You're going to be asking the questions. You're going to be shutting up and listening. And so on the receiving end, it feels to us like openness. 
it feels to us like we are not judged, we are listened to quickly, and where we are immediately um, seen and heard so that you can meet us where we are. One of the things that you should realize is that that is where you get your power from. People follow you precisely because when you walk into a situation, you don't prejudge, you don't come in with your points of view, you come in with your penetrating questions and not penetrating so that you can catch someone out. They're open-ended questions so someone can step into that space and be able to describe where they're at. And because you do that, and I'm not, I, I don't never seen you do what you do. I don't know exactly how you do what you do. But in terms of a teacher, what it feels like is it, it feels like I matter. My opinion, my frame of reference, my angle of attack, all of those things are legitimate. So I'm gonna to talk to Jazz again, I'm gonna to talk to him again, I'm gonna to talk to him again, because he, of all leaders, realizes the only way to move forward is to start with where I'm at. And that's, when you do that really well, you help people realize where they're at. So what I would strongly suggest that you do is you make this a cornerstone of your leadership, that you know what are the four or five questions, in a sense, you become known for. That when you come into a situation, when you talk to a person every week, you got a couple of your jazz questions, which everybody goes, you know what he's doing? He's trying to see where I'm at. And that's the way that we're gonna move forward. I don't know what he's gonna tell me to do next, but he's gonna at least know where I'm at. Which again, to Laura's point from a few questions ago, it sounds like, well, shouldn't everyone do that? Yeah, maybe, but if we tried to all be like jazz, we would come across as a really inauthentic version of jazz. What you can do really well though, jazz, you can build a, a routine or ritual that is question-based. So that, that everybody knows, if, some, if I'm gonna come in and ask for his advice, if I'm gonna come in and talk about goals for next month, if I'm gonna come in and talk to him about um, some new project I wanna start, that darn guy, he's gonna start with three or four really beautiful questions that'll help me understand what the first step has got to be from where I'm actually standing right now. If, if I was Mark, a teacher, essentially that's what I would get. You, you like it's funny listening to it because I work very closely with Jazz and that that is him to a T. People come to him for advice all the time. He checks in on everyone as individuals. How is everyone doing? And he sort of changes people's day and their workload depending on sort of he can gauge like even just the feeling of how they walked in in the morning and that'll change what he does for them today. And ironically, and maybe it's just the teacher thing, but Jazz will actually say, look, at the end of the day, I just want want a team of people who want to be here, get on the bus, we'll find your seat. And so a lot of times people, they'll start with us. Jazz doesn't even hardly interviews people. He says, I'm not looking for a specific, you know, like I'm not going to ask them about their resume and stuff like that. He's like, do they have a good attitude? He brings them on the team. And a lot of times people end up moving around. I mean, Jazz, I've moved around a couple of times. And again, I think that that's to the teacher part of it, right? He's listening and as a leader, actively trying to understand what makes us all tick. And I think, Jazz, for you, this is going to be great because now you just have a little bit more of a language to be able to use when you're speaking with all of us. You took the words out of my mouth, Laura, because you said I, it, it's easy. Like now there's actually words yeah. that I can use to understand. Okay, Laura is more of a pioneer. I can only take you to, you like to go to kind of third base and then say, you know what, I'm kind of done with this. As you mentioned earlier, like there's a system to it. Let's go do something new now, Jazz. Let's figure something new out. And so trying to now see and read all the other team members' uh, roles is going to be very, very fun for me. I'm, a, I'm super excited because now there's actual words that I can use. Yeah, and think about standout. There's nine of these strengths roles. This is really just like the, the notes on a scale, right? It's not the end. You learn the notes on a scale so that you can play any piece of music. But knowing the notes is a really helpful way to understand I love what that, you might- I love that, I love that, I love that. And so these nine, these aren't labels. These are like notes. You, you start with, to your point, Jez, you know, if you've got a language to start describing some of the uniquenesses of each person, that is the beginning. How exactly does Pioneer Provider play out for Laura? Well, I don't know. It might play out in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. Is it useful for us to know the Pioneer Provider play in Laura? Yes, it is. That's useful. It's a beginning point for us to explore how Laura brings her very best to the particular team that she's on. And for you, teacher provider, you know, you've, 
your whole orientation is going to be toward the idea that people are a work in progress and that they're never done. No one's ever finished. No one ever runs into your office and goes, I'm done. I'm completely developed. Like you don't, <laughs> you don't believe that. You, you know that people are always becoming and you love that. And so the challenge for you, if I was like your career coach, I'd be going, all right, listen, how do you take teacher provider? By the way, provider, of course, people have an incredible sense of safety with you. They can experiment. You're like an incubator for their innovation. You're like an incubator for their ideas. And what an incredible, now, have you cultivated that really intentionally? Have you become known for that? Is that your leadership brand? Not that those two words should be your brand necessarily, teacher provider, but, but can you take those and cultivate so that every person, when they kind of bump into jazz, we know that he's the kind of leader who does what? Who, who opens us up with his questions, who allows us the space to create and fail and create and fail and experiment again, who allows people to become a works in progress as they, as they learn and experiment and grow. They don't, he's not the kind of leader who expects perfection. He's the kind of leader who expects growth. Like, have you stepped into that clarity around who you are as a leader? Not fully, for sure. <laughs> and, well, that's and, the point of something like this, is trying to help you do that. So you can know for yourself, why do people follow me? Like, yeah. in a sense, it's trying to help you answer that question. Well, I love your comment about, uh, about the glue and the grease. That really put it, like, I got a much better understanding of the roles when I read, oh, okay, you know what? It, I am kind of like the glue and oh, the grease. provider, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I do, like we do things very quickly here. In fact, um, th this podcast recording will be out, and and fifteen pieces will be chopped from our conversation: video, audio, graphics, blog, and that will all be done very, very quickly. And 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 that's kind of the grease in me. And and mm. and in, in terms of the glue, we're gonna all do it together, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna open some beers after this, and we're gonna have some vodka, maybe, and we're gonna have, and we're just gonna talk it's about it. Settle down, settle down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marcus, I, we want to be very, very respectful of your time. I mean, we're so appreciative how much you dove in to our personal roles and gave us so much personally. But to everybody who's watching and listening, I've said this already a few times, it's a no brainer for you to take this free 15 minute assessment. I would have paid thousands as a business leader and as a team leader to understand more just even about myself, let alone the core people around me. And so for anybody who's watching or listening, I would say you're, you're being quite silly if you don't take this 15 minute assessment and get and do your own digital deep dive on Marcus and his team. We always ask our guests to leave our listeners and viewers with one tip, one strategy. Um, it could come from a mindset perspective, something that you've learned in business, entrepreneurial, or just from any aspect that you want to drop or drop some content and fire knowledge on our viewers and listeners. Marcus, thank you. The thing that we've all got to remember, each one of us, is that our life speaks to us in a language that only we understand. And when we are drawn to people, whether it's people we're trying to sell to, our customers, our clients, our prospects, whether it's other members of our team who might be drawn to us. When people are drawn to us, it's because we have figured out what are the particular aspects of our life, whether it's activities, context, situations, people, what are the particular aspects of our working life that we love? I think of these as red threads, that everyone's job is made up of fabric of many, many different threads, black, brown, white, gray, whatever, a lot of different activities, a lot of different people, a lot of different situations, some of which we put up with, some of which uh, we lean away from. But some of these uh, threads are red. Some of the activities we get invigorated by, some of these activities we lean into, some of these situations we get thrilled by. Every one of us is different, but every single one of us has red threads in our life. And what we know from data a lot of Mayo Clinic work on resilience and performance. Um, you don't need an entirely red quilt for your job to be super successful and fulfilling. In fact, the number appears to be somewhere between 19, 23, 24%, somewhere in there. If you have, let's call it 20%, you have 20% of your job as red threads, 20% of your job, just 
20% of your job is activities that invigorate you, then you are a different human. You feel different, you're sexier, more driven, more compelling, more authoritative, you learn more, you bounce back faster. 20% of your job, and it doesn't seem as though you get 30%, that's even better, 40%, you actually don't seem to get that much more of a bang if you get a high, but you get below 20, 19, 18, 17. There's almost a linear relationship between the reduction in how much time you spend doing stuff you love and your increased risk of burnout. So the one thought I would leave everyone with is find your red threads. Find the activities, situations, or people that really invigorate you and take the responsibility for weaving them into your working life. Because if you don't, no one else will. No one knows what your red threads are as, as vividly as, as you do. And although Laura didn't learn hers until she was 35, maybe, it's never too late to identify what your red I'm threads are and weave them into contribution. <laughs> yeah, you're learning it now. Well, great. That's, no, why, that's my final know. thought. It's never too late to learn what your strengths are. Marcus, thank you so much, Laura, for everything you do, as always. Thank you so much um, for everyone who's Anybody. watching. Them. Anybody who's watching and listening, go down to the episode description. All the links, everything you need to know about Marcus is there. Take the time and definitely do the assessment. Thank you so much again, Marcus. My pleasure. This has been the REC Experience Podcast with Jazz Takar, an REC Canada production. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and listening. Please, please take a second right now to subscribe and follow us on whatever podcast platform you're watching or listening. It means the world to me. Thank you.